Greetings, friends, and I'd like to welcome you to um, another video to add to the Spirit of Prophecy playlist. And we're going to get into <clears throat> a little bit more of a detail of Revelation 2.28, which states, And I will give him the morning star. In the last video, we won over the Church of Thyatira, which, in its literal sense, was a church in Asia Minor that went through some struggles and these types of things. And there was a commendation and there was a rebuke. Um, and also in the aspect that these churches, these letters to these, to these churches, can also be applied to significant points in history. And there's one point that really intrigues me of Thyatira, and that was uh, it, it, re it, it, it can also closely resemble to that of the Dark Ages. And the Dark Ages was a time before the Reformation, and there was really two groups that were the ones that really held fast to the faith. Actually, it was one group and then one individual and his followers. So you can basically say two groups, and that was the Waldenses and the Lollards, who were basically the followers of John Wycliffe, who was dubbed the Morning Star of the Reformation. That's why I think this is very interesting that we see in Revelation 2.28 that Jesus states and I will give him the morning star. Um, so we're gonna go over some brief snippets here before we go into a vast reading of a book called Rome and the Bible. Now Rome and the Bible is a very unique book. I read portions of it already. Um, and it's by David W. Cloud. And Rome in the Bible, this is out of wayoflife.org, states that to our knowledge, this is the first history ever published which details a Roman Catholic Church's relationship to the Bible from the first millennium to the present. The book could also be titled The Bible Through the Centuries. The author has spent thousands of dollars obtaining rare documents relevant to this history, such as a 1641 edition of Fox's Unabridged Acts and Monuments, and researched the topic in important theological libraries in Canada, America, and England, including the British Library. The book covers the Roman Catholic Inquisition from the 11th to the 19th century, particularly the role played by the Inquisition to keep translations of the Bible out of the hands of the common people. It contains a history of ancient separated Christians, including the Waldensians and the Lollards. It gives a history of the English Bible from John Wycliffe to William Tyndale, and the history of the Spanish, German, French, and Italian Bibles. It contains amazing biographies of royal queens who loved the Bible. It gives the decade-by-decade -decade details of papal condemnations of 19th century Bible societies and of Roman Catholic persecutions in the 19th century. It describes a 20th century phenomenon of Rome changing tactics and joining hands with the Bible societies. It documents the similarities between the Latin Vulgate and the modern versions. It answers the questions, has the Roman Catholic Church changed? The book contains 95 illustrations from rare out-of-print books, Dr. Ian Paisley, Martyrs Memorial, Presbyterian Church, Belfast, Northern Ireland, commended us for Rome in the Bible and showed us his copy in which he had written the following words, Brother Cloud does not be clouded. <laughs> Fourth edition revised and enlarged in September of 2001. So we're going to read in this video, a, you know, roughly, probably about 45 pages of this because this and within these 45 pages is going to include, um, some history of the Waldenses and their persecutions through the centuries even leading up to Wycliffe and beyond and we're gonna see what these men of faith had to endure during the Dark Ages prior to the Reformation 
Now John Wycliffe very quickly um, was the first of the famous reformers who lived from about 1320 to 1384. A period of many hardships, the Hundred Years War, the Black Death, the Peasant Revolt, and the captivity of the church at Avignon. France all happened in his lifetime. Wycliffe was born to a devout Catholic family in Northern Ireland. He attended Oxford University, receiving a degree of Doctor of Theology and becoming Professor of Theology. He was known as the Gospel Doctor because of his zeal for the Bible. He was chaplain to the King and an, and an advisor to Parliament. He created two translations of the Bible, which some say did more to free England than any war did. His writing style was very intricate, but never funny. In character, he was serious and reasonable. He never seemed to be in good health and often looked gaunt or ill, but was hospitable, pleasant, energetic, and had strong will. He lived a life deeply devoted to the Word of God. Wycliffe's entry into politics began with a clash against the Catholic Church. They asked England to pay the papacy, money owed in taxes, since King John had first recognized the Pope as overlord of England. Wycliffe disagreed and persuaded Parliament against the papacy. Wycliffe won both friends and enemies. Soon after, Wycliffe proposed a ban on the export of medals to Rome. He also proposed that the Catholic Church should hold a lower position below the government. Wycliffe believed that the Pope's rule over any nation was, unbi was unbiblical. He also believed that the evils in the Church came from wealth and power. He claimed true religion is dependent on one's relationship with God without priestly interference. He maintained that the transforming of the bread and wine of the Eucharist into the body and blood of Christ was a heresy. He also refused to accept the veneration of saints, relics, and pilgrimages. As Wycliffe's opposition to the church began to have an effect on the people, the papacy tried to silence him. Wycliffe held high standing in politics and society and made it hard for the papacy to stop him. John Wycliffe was taken to trial twice, but since he was still held in high esteem, there was no major effect. Under pressure, Oxford University expelled Wycliffe in 1382, and on December 28, 1384, Wycliffe was attacked with paralysis. He died on New Year's Eve of that same year. The papacy was unable to excommunicate Wycliffe as a heretic when he was alive. However, in 1415, the Council of Constance ordered that Wycliffe's body be dug up and burned. This was finally done in 1428, and his ashes were scattered in the Swift River. Wycliffe's legacy is one of influence and prestige. He was one of the most important religious figures in England. Two of his greatest works were to provide inspiration for a religious revival and the writing of the first English translation of the Bible. So this is just a brief bio of John Wycliffe. And it's no wonder why he was dubbed the Morning Star of the Reformation. And again, it's just very unique that Revelation 2.28, Jesus states, I will give you the morning star. So it seems like with, with all of the attacks coming against him, he was always protected. Rather, and you would have to think that this was, you know, by an act of God of sorts. You know, using politics and kings and, and noblemen to protect this man. And uh, it's just a very unique history of this individual and also the Waldenses. So let's go ahead and get down to it. I'm not going to be doing too much commenting within this reading because we got a lot to read. And you, the viewers, probably have a lot to listen to. Um, so this video might be a little long, maybe in lo longer than the first two, but. I think it is relevant that we get through this so we can advance further into the Reformation time because I want to cover the aspect of the importance of prophecy. So I'm not trying to rush this in any way, but I really feel that this is paramount that we look at, as it states in the book, Rome in the Bible, the persecutions of Peter Waldo and the Waldensians and Wycliffe and the Lollards. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. This is out of Rome in the Bible by David Cloud. 
and this is persecutions of Peter Waldo and the Waldensians. Pope Alexander III from 1159 to 1181. And by the way, this is, you know, in this book is going to really expound upon the condemnation of the Bible and the condemnation of having the Bible written into the vulgar tongue. You know, the common language of the people. This is going to really expound upon this, especially in these two sections. Pope Alexander III, 1159 to 1181 refused to sanction the scripture translations that were made by men associated with Peter Waldo, or Valdo, of Lyon, France. Armitage notes that Waldo and his fellow believers, also called Albigenses, Lionists, pa Paterines, Good Men of Lions, etc., were the first sect that commenced its existence with a popular translation, translation of the New Testament. That's out of Meritage, History of the Baptist, page 295. Waldo employed two men in translation, portions of the Bible, and extracts from the, from the fathers into the popular language, from 1160. In 1160, thus forming a little book for the people. Copies were made and circulated. The archbishop, neither teaching the Bible nor willing that others should do it, excommunicated these new teachers and expelled them from his diocese in 1176. The translators were Stephen of Ansa and Bernard Wydros, and that was out of Emeritage, page 295. Peter appealed to Rome and sent two men to lay specimens of their translations before Pope Alexander III, 1179, requesting his sanction upon, the, upon their labors. The Pope did not give his sanction for this would offend the clergy. Five years later, Pope Lucius put them under anathema. Blackburn History of the Christian Church. Here's uh, a picture of sorts of Peter Waldo appealing to scripture before the Pope, as you can see here. The Council of Tours in 1163 preached inquisition against Bible believers. This synod also called upon the bishop and clergy to forbid the Catholics to mingle with the Albigenses and to have commercial dealings with them and give them refuge. Princes were instructed to imprison them and confiscate their goods. History of the Christian Church by Schaff. The decree issued by this council stated, quote, No man must presume to receive or assist heretics, nor in buying or selling have anything to do with them, that being thus deprived of the comforts of humanity they may be compelled to repent of the error of their way." Unquote. Alexander III laid the matter of Waldo and his followers before the Third Lateran Council in 1179. Quote, the answer of the council as delivered by the Pope may be summed up in two words. You shall not under any circumstances preach except at the express desire and under the authority of the clergy of your country. Two preachers associated with Waldo who were examined by this council were ridiculed because they avowed that Christ had sent them to preach and clothe them with power of the Holy Spirit. The council discerned that if we let them in, we shall be driven forth ourselves and proclaim that the Roman church cannot endure your preaching. Many Albigenses refusing the terms were burnt in different cities in the south of France. The Third Lateran Council extended the punishments to the defenders of heretics and their friends and gave permission to princes to reduce heretics to slavery and shorten the time of penance by two years for those taking up arms against them. So let me repeat that there. The Third Lateran Council extended the punishments to the defender of heretics and their friends and gave permission to princes to reduce heretics to slavery and shorten the time of penance by two years for those taking up arms against them. So not only were the Albigenses sentenced as heretics, but those that housed them or protected them also were sentenced as heretics. George Waddington makes an important observation on the association between Peter Waldo and the Waldensians.
that we may not fall into the error of Moshim, who ascribes the origin of that sect to an individual named Waldus, Peter Waldus or Waldenses, a native of Lyons, was a layman and a merchant, but notwithstanding the avocations of a secular life, he had studied the real character of his church with attention. Followed by shame, stung with the spectacle of so much impurity, he abandoned his possession, distributed his wealth among the poor, and formed an association for the diffusion of scriptural truth. He commenced his ministry about the year 1160, having previously caused several parts of the scripture to be translated in the vulgar tongue, he expounded them with great effect to an attentive body of disciples both in France and Lombardy. In the course of his exertions he probably visited the valleys of Piedmont and there he found a people of congenial spirits. They were called the Dois, or Waldenses, men of the valleys. And as the preaching of Peter may probably have confirmed their opinions and cemented their discipline, he acquired and deserved his surname by his residence among them. At the same time, their connection with Peter and his real Leonese disciples established a notion of their identity and the Vaudois in return for the title which they had bestowed, received the reciprocal appellation of Leonists, such at least appears the most probable among many varying accounts. There are some who believe the Vaudois to have enjoyed the uninterrupted integrity of the faith even from the apostolic ages, meaning the time of the apostles. Others suppose them to have been disciples of Claudius, Turin, the evangelical prelate of the ninth century. At least it may be pronounced that great certainty that they had been long in existence before the visit of the Leonese reformer. This is out of Waddington Church History, page 289 and 290, and here is a picture of a Waldensian missionary with scripture portions handing it to, you know, the common people. J.A. Wiley, who wrote a history of the Waldenses from the 9th to the 19th century, also concurred that they predated pre Peter Waldo. Quote, their traditions invariably point to an unbroken descent from the earliest times as regards their religious belief. The Nobla Lisan, which dates from the year 1100, goes to prove that the Waldenses of Piedmont did not owe their rise to Peter Waldo of Leons, who did not appear till the latter half of that century, which was 1160. The Noble Lisan, though a poem, is in reality a confession of faith, and could have been composed only after some considerable study of the system of Christianity in contradiction in contradistinction to the errors of Rome. George Faber, who diligently researched that era, made the following observation about the Waldenses. As for the Waldenses, or the Waldenses, the religionists properly so called, tenanted from a most remote period, the Alpine Valleys of Piedmont, whence they obviously derived their name, which is equivalent to the English Valesmen or Dalesmen. There was, however, a French branch of the old Italian tree, which as a branch could claim only a comparatively modern origin. These Gallican Valdenses were the proselytes of Peter of Lyons in the 12th century, and as a wealthy merchant either by birth or by descent, was a Valensis. He at once both received himself and communicated to his disciples the name of Vaudois, from the primeval Mother Church of Italy. With the pure and primitive doctrine of the pious Dalesman, he had long, most pro probably from his very childhood, been acquainted with the full occupation of successful traffic and the consequent increase of, of worldly opulence and worldly respectability had choked the word so that it became unfruitful in a thorny soil of mere speculative knowledge. But the Lord had a purpose of mercy for the individual. The disciples of Peter the Valdo were called the poor Valdenses of Leons, an evident contradistinction to the poor Valdenses of Piedmont. 
here you can see above is a page of the Waldensians New Testament in Cambridge. Uh, this is probably what it looked like. So, and this is taken out of Piedmont Faber, History of the Ancient Valensies. 459-467. So the Waldenses themselves trace their origin to apostolic times. Again, that's the time of the apostles. God, through his wise providence, has preserved the purity of the gospel in the valleys of Piedmont from the time of the apostles down to our own time. When the Waldenses presented their confession to Francis I of France in the year 1544, it was prefaced with these words, quote, this confession is that which we have received from our ancestors, even from hand to hand, according as their pre predecessors in all times and in every age have taught and delivered. That was John Leaguer, General History of the Evangelical Churches of the Piedmont. The Bible translation produced and distributed by these ancient Christians was in the Romant language, which predated French and Italian. There is reason to believe from recent historical researches that the Waldenses possessed the New Testament in the vernacular, the lingua romana or romant tongue, which was the common language of the south of Europe from the 8th to the 14th century. It was the language of the troubadours and of men of letters in the Dark Ages. In, into this tongue, the romant was the first translation of the whole of the New Testament made so early as the 12th century. This fact, Dr. Gilly has been at great pains to prove in his work the Romant version of the Gospel according to John, William Stephen Gilly, Canon of Durham, and Vicar of Norham, London, 1848. The sum of Dr. Gilly, by a patient investigation into facts and a great array of historical documents, maintains is that all the books of the New Testament were translated from the Latin Vulgate into the Romant, that this was the first literal version since the fall of the empire, that it was made in the 12th century and was the first translation available for popular use. This Romant version was made as Dr. Gilly by a chain of proof shows most probably under the superintendence and at the expense of Peter Waldo of Leon, not later than 1180. And so is older than any complete version in German, French, Italian, Spanish, or English. This version was widely spread in the south of France and in the city of Lombard. It was in common use among the Waldenses of Piedmont, and it was no small part, doubtless, of the testimony borne to truth by these mountaineers to preserve and circulate it. Of the Romant New Testament, six copies have come down to our day. These are small, plain, and portable volumes contrasting with those splendid and ponderous folios of the Latin Vulgate, penned in characters of gold and silver, ritually illuminated, their bindings decorated with gems inviting admiration rather than study, and, and unfitted by their size and splendor for use of the people. And I just want to interject here uh, regarding the Latin Vulgate so none of us are confused by this matter. The aspect of the Latin Vulgate okay is totally different than the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus because the Latin Vulgate when you look at the line actually stems from the received text line the Latin Vulgate was written in regular Latin not pig Latin that is the dead language within the Vatican walls okay that was the difference okay just regular basic Latin was basically the language of the Italians essentially okay so I just wanted to kind of exp expound upon that a little bit just in case any of you may have gotten confused when I mentioned the Latin Vulgate and these types of things there are currently known to be seven copies I have examined two of them the one at Trinity College of Dublin and the one at Cambridge University the Waldenses busied themselves with copying the scripture for distributive, for distribution throughout Europe. And here is a replica of a Waldensian Bible school. This is a life-size model in North Carolina, the original in northern Italy. And here you can see that. Let's scroll up a little bit. Scroll down a little bit. <laughs> and there it is.
so the Waldenses busied themselves with copying the scriptures for distribution throughout Europe. The youth who here sat at the feet of the more venerable and learned of their barbs, pastors, used as their textbooks the holy scriptures. That was their textbooks in the schools. That was it. That's all they had was scripture. And not only did they study the sacred volume, which is another word for the Bible or the scriptures, they were required to commit to memory and be able and be able accurately to recite whole gospels and epistles. Part of their time was occupied in transcribing the holy scriptures or portions of them, which they were to distribute when they went forth as missionaries. By this and by other agencies, the seed of the divine word was scattered throughout Europe more widely than is commonly supposed. There was no kingdom of southern and central Europe to which these missionaries did not find their way and where they did not leave traces of their visit and the disciples whom they made. On the west they penetrated into Spain. In southern France they found congenial fellow laborers in the Albigenses by whom the seeds of truth were plentifully scattered over Dauphine and Languedoc. On the east descending the Rhine and the Danube they leavened Germany, Bohemia, and Poland with their doctrines, their track being marked with the edifices for worship and the stakes of martyrdom that arose around their steps. Even the seven hill city Rome they feared not to enter, scattering the seed on ungenial soil, if perchance some of it might take root and grow. Thus did the Bible in those ages, veiling its majesty and its mission, travel silently through Christendom, entering homes and hearts, and there making its abode from her lofty seat, Rome looked down with contempt upon the book and its humble bearers. It's out of History of the Waldenses by J.A. Wiley. And then in the mid-13th century, the Inquisitor, Renerius, gave the following testimony of the Waldenses. They can repeat, by heart, meaning by memory now, they can repeat by memory in the vulgar tongue the whole text of the New Testament and great part of the Old. This is how... <laughs> this is how um, blessed and pure these Waldenses were. Again, I need to repeat this. They can repeat by heart or by memory in the vulgar tongue, the common language, the whole text of the New Testament. Not just little verses here and there. We're talking the whole New Testament. And great parts of the Old. And adhering to the text alone, they rejected credos and, and decrees with the saints and expositions of the saints. This is a very honorable testimony. This was a witness from one of the inquisitors. And this is why they had such a hard time silencing these people and burning these books. Because the more books they burned, all they had to do was re repeat by mouth of what the books say, and there they rise again. They just keep coming, and they keep coming. You cannot stop the truth. <laughs> okay. Word to God that we had people in this day and age that could recite the whole New Testament by heart. By memory. See why that there were little lights and candles when I mentioned that about the Dark Ages? They didn't have the books, but they had a lot of it committed to their hearts. The Roman Catholic Church was of a different spirit than this. Century after century, it opposed the efforts of the Waldensians and other Bible-believing Christians to distribute the Word of God among the people. We shall see that the popes attempted to destroy the Waldensians from the face of the earth, and they almost succeeded. In every country where the Roman Catholic Church held power, the people remained ignorant of the scriptures unless they came into contact with the separated Christians. Those who were separated uh, the Roman Catholic Church would call them separatists, and so does the occult New Age. That's why they say we cannot have the separateness, but we need to have a togetherness. 
this is why the whole term separate you know separateness when you see the whole thing of being united with like the one world religion today everybody coming together but then they'll use little hidden keywords like separatists and these types of things and these are people who oppose the teachings of Rome who oppose the teachings of the world these are separatists <clears throat> we have seen that the Paulicians of the first millennium were charged with Manichaeanism. The same charge was brought against the various Bible believing groups persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church throughout the second millennium. Manichaeanism was a term originally given to the followers of a third century North African sect leader named Manes or Mani. It seems that Manichaeanism was a form of Gnosticism that combined Christian thought and paganism in various unscriptural ways. It stressed asceticism. It stressed asceticism, following are some of the principles as outlined by George Faber in his landmark History of the Ancient Waldenses and the Albigenses, that there are two independent principles, the one good and the other evil, of whom the material world was created by the evil principle, while the spiritual world was the work of the good principle. Two, that Christ was never really incarnate. His apparent flesh being a mere unsubstantial and visionary illusion because sincere matter was the work of the evil God and then inherently bad itself. It was a contradiction to assert that Christ, the son of the good God, could have assumed a true fleshly material body, that baptism by material water ought not to be administered, that the marriage ought to be reviled and rejected, that the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ were denied, that the independent principle of good and the independent principle of evil each created various angelic intelligence severally in nature resembling their respective creators six that the resurrection of the body was denied seven that freedom of the will was denied without any choice or preference the elect were fatally impelled to perform good deeds while the reprobate were no less fatally constrained to perform evil deeds these are some of the beliefs commonly attributed to the Manichaeans and these are also as I stated in the first video of defining Protestant with the Alexandrian fathers these were the commonly beliefs attributed to these Alexandrian church fathers specifically Augustine and yet here are these Catholic noblemen popes and priests and inquisitors they're labeling these people Manichaeans. While them themselves are essentially Manichaeans in and of themselves. Because what I just la listed from these principles that Faber listed are exactly the things of Gnosticism that the Roman Catholic Church believes. So by labeling these people Manichaeanisms, basically, you know, they're labeling them that. But in and of themselves, they are themselves Manichaeans. And they boast about it. <clears throat> these are some of the beliefs commonly attributed to the Manichaeans. It is difficult, though, to know exactly what Mains and his followers believe. Because most of the documentation, pay attention here. Most of the documentation comes from their enemies. Same thing with the Donatists. Most of the documentations regarding the Donatists are going to come from your, you know, the enemies of the Donatists, not from the other side. It is extremely doubtful that such principles would ever find wide acceptance or form the basis for a popular movement. The picture is further confused by the fact that the Roman Catholic authorities falsely labeled many Bible-believing people in later centuries, such as the Albigenses and the Waldensians as Manichaeans. Res respected Baptist historian John Christian makes the following comments. Quote, It is now clearly known that the Paulicians were not Manichaeans. Key of Truth in 11th Century History of the Paulicians written by Gregory Magistos and published by Translation in English in 1898 settles this matter. Modern Armenian scholars do not hesitate to correct this error. Coney Bear, one of the most knowledgeable historians of Armenia, 
has no doubt on the subject. The same thing may probably be said of the Albigenses. The Albigenses were oppressed on account of this sentiment, which accusation was also made against the Waldenses. Care must be taken at this point, and too prompt credence should not be given to the accuser. The Roman Catholic Church sought diligently for excuses to persecute. Even Luther was declared by the Synod of Sens to be a Manichaean. The celebrated Archbishop Usher says that the charge of Manichaeanism on the Albigenses sect on the Albigensian sect is evidently false. It would be difficult to understand the Albigenses from this philosophical standpoint. They were not a metaphysical people. Theirs was not a philosophy, but a daily faith and practice which which commended itself to the prosperous territory of southern France. France. That's a history of the Baptist by uh, John Christian. And moving forward, Dave Benedict and George Faber and their extensive researches into the Albigenses and Waldenses reached the same conclusion and rejected the Roman Catholic charge that these Bible-believing people were Manichaeans. Pope Lucius III from 1181 to 1185, as we have seen, placed an anathema upon Peter Waldo and his fellow Christians of Lyons, France, and continued the ban of their scripture distribution. In 1181, Lucius III issued a decree stating, quote, We declare all Puritans, Paterines, poor of Lyons, etc., etc., to lie under a perpetual curse for teaching baptism and the Lord's Supper otherwise than the Church of Rome. Lucius called a special council at Verona in 1183 and 84 in the presence of Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, quote, to bind in the chain of perpetual anathema those who presume to preach publicly or privately without the authority of the bishop. It sounds like today where you're not allowed to stand behind a pulpit unless you get permission from the state, unless you get ordained through the state you have no right to preach this is not what early Christians believed this is not what the Albigenses believed doesn't that sound vaguely familiar isn't America kind of resembling the image of the beast in this regard the following are excerpts from the actual decree of Pope Lucius III So this is what Pope Lucius III had to say in this decree. Quote, To abolish the malignity of diverse heresies which of late time are sprung up in most parts of the world, it is but fitting that the power committed to the church should be awakened, that by the concurring assistance of the imperial strength, both the insolence and male partness, which means sauciness, impudent pet pertness or forwardness, of the heretics and their false designs may be crushed and the truth of Catholic simplicity shining forth in the Holy Church may demonstrate her pure and free from the execrableness of their false doctrines. Wherefore, we, being supported by the presence and power of our most dear son Frederick, the most illustrious emperor of the Romans, always increaser of the empire, with the common advice and counsel of our brethren and other patriarchs, archbishops, and many princes who, from several parts of the world, are met together, do set ourselves against these heretics. More particularly, we declare all Cathari, Paterines, and those who call themselves the humble or poor of Leons, Passagines, Josephines, Arnoldists, to lie under perpetual anathema. We therefore conclude under the same sentence of a perpetual anathema, all those who either being forbid or not sent, do notwithstanding presume to preach publicly or privately without any authority received either from the apostolic see or from the bishops of their respective dioceses. As likewise, all those who are not afraid to hold or teach any opinions concerning the sacrament of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, baptism, the remission of sins, matrimony, or any other sacraments of the church differing from what the Holy Church of Rome doth preach and observe. So regardless of what the Bible says, if it differs from what the Holy Church of Rome preaches and observes, you're a heretic, you're under anathema. 
And generally, all those whom the same church of Rome or the several bishops in their diocese, with the advice of their clergy, or the clergy themselves in case of a vacancy of the see, with the advice, if need be, of neighboring bishops, shall judge to be heretics. And we likewise declare all entertainers and defenders of the said heretics, and those that have showed any favor or given countenance to them, thereby strengthening them in their heresy, whether they be called comforted, believers, or perfect, or with whatsoever superstitious names they disguise themselves to be liable to the same sentence. And that was a decree issued by Pope Lucius III. The papal decree illustrates the pompous attitude of the popes all through the centuries. They claim to have inherited the position of the Apostle Peter, but they do not believe what Peter taught and they do not act like Peter acted. Peter never yoked together with the secular Roman authorities and never persecuted those who refused to believe like he did. Peter did not seek to rule over all the churches in the manner of Roman Catholic popes. There is no evidence that he was considered chief among the apostles. When the council was held in Jerusalem to settle the matter of law and grace, James, rather than Peter, was the spokesman for the assembled apostles and teachers. You can read about that in Acts 15, 13-22, of course. The Apostle Paul was chosen of God to give us more of the New Testament scripture than Peter. We learn more about Paul in the book of Acts and in the epistles than about Peter. There is no evidence that Peter ever visited Rome, and certainly not that he established any sort of papacy there. The popes are impostors who have persecuted the true churches of God. The decree also stated, quote, And as some with a certain appearance of piety, but denying the real sense of the apostles' words, arrogate to themselves the right of preaching, although the very same apostle says, How will they preach if they are not sent? We include under the same perpetual anathema all those who, in spite of our interdiction and without being sent by us, shall dare to preach, whether in private or in public, contrary to the authority represented by the apostolic see and the bishops. Unquote. These proud men took to themselves the authority to call men to preach the gospel an authority that belongs solely to Jesus Christ. In Matthew 28, 18-20, Christ, after his resurrection, gave the commission to go into all the world and preach. No pope can revoke this. Waldo was driven forth as a wanderer in France, Italy, and Bohemia, where he died. His followers were widely scattered northward up the Rhine, westward through France, and across the Pyrenees and eastward as far as Prague. In 1210, Innocent III invited them to reunite with the Roman Church, but they went on independent and earnest in their work. They became allied to the Waldenses, allied to the Waldenses, and in certain countries of the South, they had more schools than the Catholics. That's out of William Blackburn, History of the Christian Church. By the way, all these quotes that this author is using is from very, very old history. We're talking from the early 19th century all the way back to the 17th century. So this was these this research in this book is very very close and relevant to the times of the Dark Ages. Very close. Pope Celestine the Third from 1191 to 1198 also ordered Bible believers and their books to be committed to the flames. In 1193, the Pope sent Guy and Rainer, two legates, into France, who instructions of the most sanguinary description. Instead of making converts of the heretics, their orders were to burn their leaders, confiscate their goods, and disperse their flocks. They were not equally successful in every province. The Pope therefore instigated the inert inhabitants of those provinces where the legates were least successful. To persecute the Albigenses, consequently, many of the leading persons among them perished in the flames for a succession of years. Celestine III also ordered the destruction of Bible believers in Spain. In 1194, he sent the Cardinal St. Angelo as legate to attend a council at Lerida who prevailed on Alfonso II, King of Aragon, to publish an edict ordering the Vaudois, poor men of Lyons, and all other heretics to quit his territories under severe pains. 
That's out of McCry, History of the Reformation in Spain, page 33. This edict was renewed in 1197, and all governors and judges were required to swear before the bishops that they would assist in discovering and punishing those infected with heresy under the penalty of being themselves treated as heretics. Doesn't this kind of stuff kind of sound familiar to the quote-unquote police state in America that we so hear rapidly about, you know, rapidly about? I mean, does that ring a bell again? An image to the beast? And we are led to believe that this is a new world order? Pope Innocent III, Father of the Inquisition. This is where it's going to get a little hair-raising to some, you know, if, you know, just pre-warning you right now. Here's a portrait of Pope Innocent III. He was nowhere near innocent, mind you. Father of the Inquisition. It was during the reign of Innocent III, 1198 to 1216, that the Inquisition formally began. Though it is obvious from the previous facts that Bible believers had been persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church for centuries before this, Innocent III systematized the Inquisition more thoroughly than his predecessors. This Pope declared that heretics should forfeit their lives. He also forbade the people to read the Bible in their own language. In the year 1215, Innocent issued a command, quote, that they shall be seized for trial and penalties who engage in the translation of the sacred volumes, or the Bible, or who hold secret conventicles, or who assume the office of preaching without the authority of their superiors, against whom process shall be commenced without any permission of appeal. They wanted everything. Nothing was to be given to those outside her ranks, meaning preachers, the Bible, everything was to come from the priests or the popes or the bishops, and that was it. And you were to listen and obey. You were not to go out and spread the gospel. You were not to hold any of these secret meetings. You were not to have any portions of scripture in a common language because you were too low of esteem to be able to possess such a sacred volume essentially this is what the church believed then and it's what the church believes today maybe different diversionary tactics but it's the same thing Innocent, quote, declared that as by the old law, the beast touching the holy mount was to be stoned to death. So simple, and so simple and uneducated men were not to touch the Bible or venture to preach its doctrines. So anyone that is not a priest of the Catholic Church, monk, nun, pope, whatever, are stupid. And stupid people cannot touch the Bible or venture to preach its doctrines. Religious persecutions assumed new forms. The Age of Innocent was one of terror to all liberty of thought and worship. Innocent III caused search to be made after the Waldenses in all places. We have a letter of his writ to those of Metz, where he ordains them to be driven out and persecuted with the extremest bar barbarity. Because they took the liberty to read the scriptures translated by Peter Waldo into the Walder vulgar tongue. The Waldensians, so brutally tormented under Innocent III and many other popes, almost 100 pages of the large format 17th century Martyr's Mirror describes the persecutions against these people. And here is a cave of Casaluzzo in which hundreds of Waldensian mothers and children were murdered. This is a uh, pencil drawing of this cavern. 
so brutally tormented under Innocent III and many other popes, almost 100 pages of the large format 17th century martyr's mirror describe the persecutions against these people were always described as a people who loved the Bible. Their converts were made by the Bible and religious books. They went as peddlers to a cottage or a nobleman's castle, offering fabrics or jewelry for sale. And when asked if they had anything else, they answered, yes, great rarities. I have one precious stone through which you can see God and another that kindles love to him in the heart. With that, these peddlers brought out the precious roll of Holy Writ. That's a meritage of history of the Baptists. And the, pref and the preface of the Olivetan French Bible, the translators say that the Waldenses have always had the full enjoyment of that heavenly truth contained in the Holy Scriptures ever since they were enriched with the same by the apostles themselves. Leaguer, a Waldensian pastor who lived during the unspeakably brutal persecutions of the 17th century and his general history of the evangelical churches of the Piedmontese valleys, says that the ancient scripture manuscripts of the Roman Catholics were full of falsifications. On the other hand, he quotes Beza, who published an edition of the Greek received text during the Reformation, as saying, quote, that one must confess it was by means of the Vaudois of the valleys that France today has the Bible in her own language. No characteristic was more marked in the Waldensians than their love for the sacred volume, and this love compelled them to share their treasures with others by translation into the Flemish, German, and French. Herzog finds no sect which was so zealous for the circulation of the, of the scriptures as they, the Waldensians, laid down the Bible as the foundation and practically built upon its truths. A Roman inquisitor, in speaking of them, tells us they can say a great part of the Old and New Testaments by heart. They despise the decretals and the sayings and expositions of holy men and cleave only to the text of scripture. That was the authority of these people, was the scripture. Not one, not man, not priest, not prelate, but the authority of the Bible, which in a sense is the word of God, which there was the word of God made flesh. That was their authority. No pope, no priest, prelate, whatever. They contend that the doctrine of Christ and his apostles is sufficient to salvation without any church statutes and ordinances, and affirm that the traditions of the church are no better than the traditions of the Pharisees, insisting, moreover, that greater stress is laid on the observation of human tradition than on the keeping of the law of God. History of the Baptist, Thomas Armitage No wonder they were hated by the ecclesiastical authorities who had perverted the, perverted the simple New Testament faith. And by the way, here is a picture of the Catholic authorities burning Bibles here. The light brought by the scriptures exposed Rome's heresies. The persecutions that Rome poured out upon these peace-loving people were intended to destroy them as well as their scriptures. And as Revelations chapter 2 regarding the Thyatira church, these are those that have not learned the depths of Satan. They knew of them because of their errors and falsehoods and the rituals and their, tra and, and their traditions. But they clung, they clung to the light that they had in a very dark place. The crusade of Simon of Montfort so utterly destroyed them that Sismondi says Simon stamped out not only a people but a literature. The efforts of their enemies were so thorough that we will not know the details of the history of those ancient God-fearing people until we can per peruse heaven's libraries. Historian Thomas Armitage opens for us a window into the frightful persecutions initiated by Innocent III against the Waldensians. Quote, Many of them were frozen to death. Others were cast from high precipices and dashed to pieces. Some were driven into caverns, and by filling the mouths of their caves with faggots were suffocated. 
Others were hanged in cold blood, ripped open and disemboweled, pierced with prongs, drowned, racked limb from limb till death relieved them, were stabbed, worried by dogs, burned or crucified with their heads downward. Fox relates one case in which 400 mothers who had taken refuge in the cave of Castelluzzo, some 2,000 feet above the valley, entering by a projecting crag, were smothered with their infants in their arms. And all the time that this gentle, that this gentle blood was flowing, that sanctified beauty known as Innocent III drank it in like nectar of paradise. Of the Waldensians and other murdered sheep of Christ, he said, they are like Samson's foxes. This is what Innocent III said. They appear to be different, but their tails are tied together. The bloodthirst of, Domin of the Dominicans earned for them the stigma of Dominique Canes, or the Lord's Dogs. We call them the Hounds of Hell. That's what I'd call them. Another description of the persecutions against the Waldenses and their literature during the days of Innocent III is given by William Blackburn. The Bible was rarely translated, but wherever parts of it were rendered into popular language, we see a people rejoicing in the light. A striking instance is found at Metz, on the Mosile, which is in France. Some poor men of Lyons, or Waldenses, brought their certain books of the Bible in the French language. Men and women eagerly read them. They formed Bible reading societies. The priests tried to stop their meetings, but the members said God meant his word for the people of every class. So the priests tried to stop their meetings, but the members again said God meant his word for the people of every class. These books teach us far more than you ever do. We cannot give them up. The bishop reported them to Pope Innocent III. To the people, he said, It is not proper for you to hold your meetings in private, nor to act as preachers, nor to ridicule the priests. Remember that men must have a special training before they can understand the deep things of Holy Scripture. The priests are trained for this purpose. Listen to them. Respect even the most ignorant of them. Beware of thinking that you alone are correct and despising those who do not join you. Doesn't that kind of sound like some of the words of Pope Francis? And this was hundreds and hundreds of years ago. You know, beware of thinking that you alone are correct. So does that kind of tell me that the church has changed? No, it has not changed, folks. And despising those who do not join you, unquote. Then he threatened them with severity if they did not heed his paternal advice. Thus he laid down the doctrine which Romanists have ever since taught. It is very well for you to know the Bible, but your priest must teach it to you, in what manner and measure he pleases. The result was that Cistercian abbots were sent to Metz to suppress this Bible reading. The truth-seeking laymen, in their pious simplicity, had found out too many priestly errors for the comfort of the priests. They persisted in holding their meetings. They were called Waldensians, as if that were a hard name. Force was applied to them. They were routed. Their versions were burnt. So far as possible, their opinions rooted out. The priests of Metz breathed freely again and went on in their old ways of ignorance, idleness, and vicious selfishness. Like cases seem to have occurred at Auxerre and various towns in France until the Council of Toulouse in 1229 forbade the laity to possess the books of the Old and New Testament in any language. And even popular versions of the Psalter, the Bravery, and the Hours of the Blessed Mary, special condemnation was hurled at the scriptures sent forth by Peter Waldo in the, romance, in, in the Romance tongue. These must be burnt. That's Blackburn Church History, page 314 and 15. The Martyr's Mirror, the amazing record that traces the martyrs for the New Testament faith from the time of Christ to 1660 AD also concurs that the Christians persecuted at Metz were despised by the Romanists because they had translated the Holy Scripture into their mother tongue. The persecutions under Innocent III were incredibly barbaric. Three methods were used by the Inquisitors to test whether an accused person was innocent or guilty of heresy. And we're going to go over them. 
In the trial by hot iron, a piece of red hot metal was placed into the hand of the accused, who was forced to walk nine paces while the iron burned into his hand. The hand was then wrapped in cloth by the priest, and at the end of three days was examined. If there was a wound, the accused was declared guilty and was punished or martyred. The trial by hot water was similar to this. The accused was forced to thrust his hand up to the elbow into a kettle of boiling water. In the trial by cold, cold water, the accused was forced to strip naked and then thrown into a canal or river. If he floated, he was immediately condemned. If he sank, he was considered innocent. This sounds like a particularly cruel version of heads I win, tails you lose. In 1215, Conrad of Marburg, the Grand Inquisitor, who had been appointed by the Pope, apprehended more than 80 persons, tried them by the red-hot iron, condemned them, and then burnt all of them on the same day at Strasbourg, Germany. Great numbers of others were likewise tormented. The Bible was also translated into Italian during the 13th century. According to Professor Minocci, the 13th century version of the Italian Bible sprang like many of the other old versions, anonymously from the people who required a means of affirming the religious ideas born in them by the change that had taken place in their minds and conscience. But if we consider its intimate relationship with the contemporary heretical translations of France, Province, and Savoy, we may safely believe that the first Italian versions had its origin in some centers of a sect called the Poor of Italy. And if we consider its phraseology, we may even more definitely hold that it was issued by the Tuscan Patronetic. Wherever the Bible appeared in the common tongue of the people, wherever it was proclaimed unencumbered by Rome's traditions, Rome sought to extinguish the light it brought to benighted men. The Roman authorities did not necessarily mind when the scriptures were available in Latin, a language not spoken by the common people. It was the translation of scripture into the common tongues that raised their ire. To counter the powerful influence of the traveling missionaries that were associated with the Waldenses, Pope Innocent III established two orders of monks that traveled about in imitation of the evangelical missionaries, but they preached Rome's unscriptural dogmas. One of these was the Friars of St. Francis of Assisi. This is out of Faber, History of the Ancient Valenses. The infamous Crusades against the heretics were first instigated by Pope Innocent III. The Crusades were not all directed toward reclaiming Christian territory from the Muslims in the Middle East. Many were raised against separatists who were labeled heretics. In the year 1209, a formidable army of crossbearers of 40 days' service was put into motion, destined to destroy all heretics. The cruelties of these crusades appear to have had no parallel. In a few months, there were sacrificed about 200,000 lives, and barbarities practiced before unheard of, which met the approbation of Innocent III. Two large cities, Beziers and Car Carcassonne, were reduced to ashes, and thousands of others, driven from their burning houses, were wandering in the woods and mountains, sinking daily under the pressure of want. The Waldensians' persecutions continued century after century. Notwithstanding the persecutions which was waged against the Waldenses, they spread within a century over a wide territory, including large parts of France and Italy. The persecution in this period was less severe than in later times, and yet there were many executions. Not less than 80 Waldensian men and women were burned, burned at the stake in 1211 at Strasbourg and Alsace. Seven were burned at the stake in Murillac in Spain in 1214. In Germany there occurred from 1231 to 1233 the first general persecutions of the Waldenses, meaning all the people of the, of the nation were called to witness general generally so a lot of the times when all these tortures and inquisitions happened this happened privately 
out of the view of the public. Okay. So I just want to say that's the reason why they said the first general persecution. Despite persecution, the spread of the Waldenses continued. In Upper and Lower Austria, Waldensian schools, as their pl places for regular worship were called, were found in 1260 in upward of 50 places. In 1315, in a small political district in Lower Austria, there were Waldenses in 36 villages and towns. In the whole dukedom of Austria, the number of their adherents were calculated to be above 80,000. They also carried on successful missionary work in Bohemia, Moravia, Cerinthia, Syria, Austrian provinces, and in Silesia, Brandenburg, modern Prussia, which is modern Prussia, Pomerania, and Poland, according to a statement made by the Waldensian bishop Neumeister, who in 1315 was burned at the stake in Himburg near Vienna. They were very strong numerically in Bohemia and Moravia. In Schweidnitz, a village of Silesia, no less than 50, among them a number of women and young people, were burned at the stake in 1315. Very many suffered martyrdom in Poland about the year 1309. Toward the end of that century, the Waldenses were numerous in Hungary and had also spread into Transylvania. In Saxony and Mecklenburg, they were found about 50 years later. About a decade before the year 1400, a terrible persecution of the Waldenses began in the provinces and countries named above. The meager extant remnants of the records of this persecution are sufficient to give an adequate idea of their strength in these countries. In southern Bohemia, whole villages adhered to the Waldensian faith. In Moravia, they were so numerous that the Roman hierarchy almost despaired of getting the mastery of the situation. In Brandenburg, Pomerania and Mecklenburg, no less than 443 persons were arrested in 1393 for the Waldensian heresy. Among them were persons whose parents already had been Waldenses. In Austria, so many persons were accused as Waldenses and given a hearing that the minutes of the trials filled three thick volumes. 38 Waldenses were executed in 1393 at various places in Bavaria. 300 persons were burned at the stake in various parts of Saxony in 1416. In 1446, 12 persons were burned at the Nordhausen. And in 1454, 22 persons at Sangerhausen in Saxony. And this is out of John Horst, Mennonites in Europe. So, I mean, just think about this for a moment now. From, let's just say, maybe the beginning of the 11th century all the way up until the middle of the 15th century and beyond these people held on to their faith at the same time being continuously hounded and continuously persecuted Pope Honorius III from 1216 to 1227. He followed in the footsteps of his terrifying inquisitions and crusades upon Bible-believing Christians known variously as Albigenses, Paterines, etc., who maintained the sufficiency of the scriptures in faith and practice and who denied the authority of the Roman hierarchy. From 1220 to the year of his death, Honorius labored to obtain edicts against the separatists from the emperor and also issues a series of bulls from his own pen denouncing the separatists and condemning them to death. The edicts declare that all those patrons to whom the bishops were disposed to show favor were to have their tongues pulled out that they might not corrupt others by justifying themselves. Others were to be committed to the flames. So much for the representative of Christ on earth, huh? No alternative of escaping those human monsters presented itself but that of flight, which was embraced by many. Indeed, Moshim observes they passed out of Italy and spread like an inundation throughout the European provinces, but Germany in particular afforded an asylum where they were called Gasseri instead of Catheri, or Puritans. 
Orchard tells us the result of these murdering persecutions, the Albigensian church was now drowned in blood. Their race for the present disappeared. Their opinions ceased to influence society. No calculations can ascertain the quantity of wealth dissipated or the destruction of human life which resulted from these crusades. So basically, in a sense, out of Pope, the reign of Pope Honorius III, the Albigensian church was utterly destroyed. Totally. Every one of them. The slaughter had been so prodigious, the massacre so universal, the terror so profound and of so long duration that the Church of Rome appeared completely to have attained her object. Terror became extreme, suspicion universal, all teaching of the prescribed doctrines had ceased. The very sight of a book, the very sight of a book made the people tremble. Connected with these persecutions was, was the destruction of books and scripture translations. During this same period, Frederick II, head of the Holy Roman Empire from 1215 to 1250, ratified the Pope's Inquisition. He made laws against heretics, and in 1224, he condemned them either to be burnt or to have their tongues torn out at the discretion of the judge. That's how the shaft history of the Christian Church. Frederick's subsequent legislation was commended by popes and bishops and ordered to be inscribed in municipal statute books. The King of France, Louis IX, made the Papal Inquisition the law of the land in 1228. Here we have Pope Gregory IX from 1227 to 1241, which followed Honorius III and basked in the splendor of the papacy for 13 years. This, this, this guy was a... Pardon my French, because he's, he's, you know, the papacy is without the father. So I would have to see that he is a fatherless individual. So as a King James puts it, I will say it like this, that Pope Gregory the Ninth, when you read this, he was definitely a very pompous bastard. Okay. Followed Honorius III and Bass in the splendors of the papacy for 13 years, he was the nephew of the bloodthirsty Innocent III. The following descriptions of Gregory's coronation helps us understand the power and wealth of the papacy during the Middle Ages. And just listen to this. On the day of his coronation, he proceeded to St. Peter's, accompanied by several prelates, and assumed the pallium according to custom. And after having said Mass, he marched to the palace of the Latran, covered with gold and jewels. On Easter Day, he celebrated Mass solemnly at Sta Maria Mag. Maggiore, and returned with the crown on his head. On Monday, having said Mass at St. Peter's, he returned wearing two crowns, mounted on a horse richly caparisoned and surrounded by cardinals, clothed in purple, and a numerous clergy. The streets were spread with tapestry, inlaid with gold and silver, the noblest productions of Egypt, and the most brilliant colors of India, and perfumed with various aromatic odors. The people chanted aloud, Kyrie Eleeson and their songs of joy were accompanied by the sound of trumpets, the judges and the officers shone in gilded habits and caps of silk. Gregory forbade the people to possess the Bible and suppress Bible translations, as we have already seen. It was during the early part of the 13th century that the Waldenses translated the Bible into the Romance and Teutonic languages. Professor S. Minocci, writing in 1904, noted that among the Waldenses, the New Testament was sought after and was spread about, and in its pages were found the condemnation of the Church of Rome and its faulty clergy. And at that time, and at the same time, the hope of religious revival among the people. Orchard tells us that at Toulouse, it is said that the first society in France was formed for circulating the Bible in the vernacular tongue. The response from the Roman Catholic authorities were predictable. Translations among the Albigenses and Waldenses were burned, and people burnt for having them. The Council of Toulouse in 1229 and the Council of Tarragona in 1234 forbade the laity to possess or read the vernacular translations of the Bible. That's even now the Catholic Dictionary. So they're not afraid to admit it. The Council of Toulouse used these words, 
quote, We prohibit the permission of the books of the Old and New Testament to laymen, except perhaps they might desire to have the Psalter or some breviary for the divine service or the hours of the Blessed Virgin Mary for devotion. Expressly forbidding their having the other parts of the Bible translated into the vulgar tongue. According to P. Marion Sims, it was the Waldensian translations from the Latin, known as the Romant Version, which was specifically condemned at Toulouse in 1229. The Toulouse Council ordered that the bishops appoint in each parish one priest and two or three laics who should engage upon oath to make a rigorous search after all heretics and their abettors, and for this purpose should visit every house from the garret to the cellar, together with all subterraneous places where they might conceal themselves. There was no escape from the Inquisition machine. The Synod of Tarangona ordered all vernacular versions to be brought to the bishop to be burned. Referring to the Inquisition, that was permanently established by the Council of Toulouse, historian William Blackbird said, No legalization instituted has ever done more to crush intellectual and religious liberty or added more to the unspoken miseries of the human race. Every layman daring to possess a Bible, now first forbidden to the laity by this council, was in peril of the rack, the dungeon, and the stake. The history of the Church of, in Spain for 650 years is mainly that of the Inquisition and its destruction of human life. It was in Spain during the reign of Pope Innocent III that the Inquisition had begun to be formed into a brutal, all-pervading mechanism. It was only left for Innocent's nephew, Gregory IX, to expand the Inquisition to all Catholic countries and to fine-tune its bar barbarities. Dominic Guzman, founder of the Dominican Order of Catholic Priests, was one of the chief agents. Before his time, every bishop was a sort of inquisitor in his own diocese, but it was his invention, Dominic's, to incorporate a body of men, independent of every human being except the Pope, for the express purpose of ensnaring and destroying Christians. And here is a, a drawing, illustration of an Inquisition torture chamber. You know, so that's basically an example of that. At the beginning of the 13th century, about the year 1215, Dominic broke down the claim, the Dominic broke down the dam, and covered Toulouse with a tide of despotism stained with human blood. Posterity will hardly believe that this enemy of mankind, after he had formed a race like himself, called first preaching, and then friars, died in his bed, was canonized for a saint, and proposed as a model of piety and virtue to succeeding generations. This was accomplished by the publication of two papal bulls on August 20, 1233. From this point forward, the Dominicans and Franciscans directed the Inquisition terrors. In 1234, an edict was made in Spain by Don Jane, James of Aragon, which prohibited the use of any part of the Old or New Testament in the vernacular tongue, and commanded all, whether lady or clergy, who possessed such books, to deliver them to their ordinaries to be burnt on the pain of being held suspected of heresy. Other laws were passed and a severe inquisition was established in Aragon at this time. The edicts were made at the instigation of the Catholic prelates, Lee, a, which, is, uh, which is out of Lee, Lee, a history of the inquisition unabridged from 1887. Here's a drawing of the rack and how that basically panned out. Basically, you were stretched out on this instrument and... Your arms, your limbs were pulled to the extent that every single limb was pulled out of its socket. That's basically the instrument of the rack. Gregory IX issued a papal brief in 1236 to introduce the Inquisition into Castile and Spain. 
Ferdinand III is said to have carried with his own hand the wood destined for burning his subjects. In 1237, 15 Bible believers were burned alive in Cardan and Castlebon in Spain, and the remains of 18 others were condemned, dug up from the ground, and burned. In the year 1238, Pope Gregory IX issued a bull that promised forgiveness of sins for all who would join his crusade against the heretics. Listen to this. That all persons may more willingly and efficiently execute the duty thus committed unto them to all who, according to the call of the inquisitors, attend to their various stations twenty days, to them who afford counsel and favor, and hearty aid in persecuting heretics, and the favorers, receivers, and defenders of them, and all other rebels against the church, whether in fortified places or castles, from the mercy of God Almighty, and of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, and by his authority, we relax three years of the penance enjoined upon them, and if any person shall die during the persecution, prosecution of that affair, we grant them a full pardon of all their sins. Oh, how wonderful. And we bestow upon the brethren the entire faculty of using all means to prosecute the work and of executing ecclesiastical censure upon the refractory and the rebellious. And before I continue, I want to reemphasize that Augustine was, a, was in strong favor of this type of persecution, by the way, whom a lot of you Protestants out there adhere to as a very prominent figure. I just want to, you know, bring that to memory. It was during the reign of Gregory the Ninth that the Catholic Inquisition, which began under Innocent III, was fashioned into the all-pervading form it was to enjoy for the next 500 years. Henry Lay, in his three-volume history of the Inquisition of the Middle Ages, described the terror that was created by this persecution machine. By the terms of the Treaty of Paris, all public officials were obliged to aid in the Inquisition and capture of heretics, and all inhabitants, males over 14 years of age and females over 12, were to be sworn to reveal all offenders to the bishops. Council of Narbonne in 1229 put these provisions in force, that of Albi in 1254 including inquisitors among those to whom the heretic was to be denounced. The aid demanded was freely given, and every inquisitor was armed with royal letters empowering him to call upon all officials for safe conduct, escort, and assistance in the discharge of his functions. Thus the whole force of the state was unreservedly at command of the holy office. Not only this, indeed, but every individual was bound to lend his and when called upon, and any slackness of zeal exposed him to excommunication as a falter, favorer, or patron of heresy. Leading after 12 months, it neglected to conviction as a heretic with all its tremendous penalties. Here is a picture of the heretic's fork, and basically what this is is you have two prongs placed at the base of the stern, sternum and at the bottom of the, of the chin, and basically what this did is it basically separated completely, slowly, mind you, the sternum from the chin. The right to ab okay. The right to abrogate any laws which embedded the freest exercise of the powers of the Inquisition was likewise arrogated on both sides of the Alps. In the exercise of this almost limitless authority, Inquisitors were practically relieved from all supervision and responsibility. Even a papal legate was not to interfere with them or inquire into heresy within their inquisitorial districts. At first their commissions were thought to be expire were thought to expire with the death of the Pope who issued them, but in twelve sixty seven they were declared to be continuously valid. Under the canon law, anyone from the meanest to the highest who opposed or impeded in any way the functions of an inquisitor or gave aid or counsel to those who did so became at once ipso facto excommunicate. After the lapse of a year in this condition, he was legally a heretic to be handed over without further ceremony to the secular arm for burning, without trial and without forgiveness. The awful authority 
which thus shrouded the Inquisitor, was rendered yet more terrible by the, elast the elasticity of definition given to the crime of, imp of impeding the holy office and the tireless tenacity with which those guilty of it were perused, pursued. If friendly death came to shield them, the Inquisition attacked their memories and visited their offenses upon their children and grandchildren. The Papal Inquisition constituted a chain of tribunals throughout continental Europe, perpetually manned by those who had no other work to attend to. By constant interchange of documents and mutual cooperations, they covered Christendom with a network rendering escape almost hopeless. This combined with the most careful preservation and indexing of records produced a system of police produced a system of police singularly perfect for a period when international communication was so imperfect. The Inquisition had a long arm, a sleepless memory, and we can well understand the mysterious terror inspired by the secrecy of its operations and its almost supernatural vigilance. If public proclamation was desired, it summoned all the faithful. General, remember we just mentioned that? It summoned all the faithful with promises of eternal life and reasonable temporal reward to seize some designated heresiarch and every parish priest where he was suspected to be hiding was bound to spread the call before the whole population. If secret information was required, there were spies and familiars trained to the work. The record of every heretical family for generations could be traced out from the papers of one tribunal or another. A single lucky capture and extorted confession would put the sleuth hounds on the track of hundreds who deemed themselves secure, and each new victim added to his circle of denunciations. The heretic lived over a volcano which might burst forth at any moment. Flight was of little avail. Descriptions of heretics who disappeared were sent throughout Europe to every spot where they could be supposed to seek refuge putting the authorities on the alert to search for every stranger who wore the air of one differing in life and conversation from the ordinary run of the faithful. To human apprehension, the Papal Inquisition was well nigh ubiquitous, omniscient, and omnipotent. The organization of the Inquisition was simple yet effective. It did not care to impress the minds of men with magnificence, but rather to paralyze them with terror. It was the duty of every man to give information as to all cases of heresy with which he might become acquainted under pain of incurring the guilt of faltership or patronship. The effectiveness of the organization was unhampered by any limits of jurisdiction and was multiplied by the cooperation of the tribunals everywhere so that there was no resting place, no harbor of refuge for the heretic in any land where the Inquisition existed. Vainly might he change his abode, it was ever on his track. A suspicious stranger would be observed and arrested. His birthplace would be ascertained, and as soon as swift messengers could traverse the intervening distance, full official documents as to his antecedents would be received from the holy office of his former home. The net of the Inquisition extended everywhere, and no prey was too small to elude its meshes. That's out of lay history of the Inquisition unabridged, Page 340 to 396. Under the reign of Pope Innocent IV, from 1243 to 1254, persecutions continued against the Waldensian Christians, and attempts continued to, make, to be made to suppress their scripture distribution. In 1246, at Beziers, the old Albigensian town, laymen were forbidden to have any theological books even in Latin, while clergy and laity were alike forbidden to have them in their mother, in their mother tongue. Innocent IV was responsible for introducing torture into the official proceedings of the Inquisition in 1252 with his bull Ad Extrapenda, Leia, History of the Inquisition. This bull condemned heretics to death and was to be inscribed in perpetuity in all the local statute books. Any attempt to modify it was a crime, which condemned the offender to perpetual infamy and a fine enforced by the ban. Innocent IV, quote, found it necessary to give full powers to his inquisitors 
and to erect a standing tribunal. If possible, in every country where Puritans were known to infest, these inquisitors were armed with all imaginable power to punish all those persons who dared to think differently than the Pope and his successors. Philip Schaff says that Innocent IV and Alexander IV alone issued more than 100 such bulls. It was during the reign of Innocent IV that the Council of Narbonne was held in the year 1244 for the purpose of aiding and abetting for the purpose of aiding and abetting the recently established Holy Office of Holy Dominic in its project of exterminating the reputed heretics of southern France, this council issued the following depraved canons. Canon number 22, this is, a, this is from canon law now, and these canons are not done away with, they're still valid today. Canon number 22, inquisitors were forbidden to reveal the names of witnesses. Canon number 24, the testimony of infamous persons, of criminals, and of those who confessed themselves to have been accomplices should be received in the process of the Inquisition against the Albigenses. Canon number 26, he who shall have been convicted by witnesses, or though any other proofs, shall henceforth be always reputed a heretic, even though he should deny the truth of the allegation. So under this perverted system, a Bible believer could be charged with Manichaeanism, or witchcraft, or immorality, or any other preposterous thing, and his accuser, no matter how untrustworthy, remained anonymous. And the charge would be received, whether or not there was any proof to sustain it. Does that again sound like today in the aspect of being charged as a, as a proponent of hate speech, or as a proponent of terrorism? It took all legal protection away from people and placed them utterly at the mercy of the brutal inquisitors. And it goes on further. Pope Alexander IV, 1254 to 1261, also loved to persecute Bible believers. Between 1255 and 1258, he issued no less than 38 bulls against heretics. In the year 1255, for example, a papal bull proclaimed, House of heretics are to be destroyed and the materials to be distributed. The bull for the establishment of the Dominicans as permanent inquisitors was issued in 1258. Between the years 1260 and 1261, Alexander issued another 13 bulls calling for the persecution of heretics. For more than a century after Innocent III, the enforcement of the rules for the detection and punishment of heretics formed the continental subject of bulls issued by the Apostolic See and of Senado action, especially in southern France and Spain. It was in 1260 that a Catholic inquisitor named Passo wrote a tract attacking the heresy of the Waldensians. One of his chief concerns was that they have translated the New and Old Testament into the vulgar tongue, and this they teach and learn. Pope Urban IV from 1261 to 1264. Immediately after his accession to the pontifical throne, issued a most direful anathema against all heretics and the opponents of the Inquisition. Pope Clement IV, 1265-1268, and 1265, enlarged and sanctioned the edicts of the Emperor Frederick and the Popes Innocent IV and Alexander IV. Inquisitors must compel secular magistrates of cities and other places under penalty of the excommunication and interdict to subscribe and inviolably to keep the constitutions of Innocent IV notwithstanding any indulgence of the court of Rome. During these years, the Inquisition raged in Spain and other parts of Europe. The Inquisitors of Barcelona, not satisfied with condemning living heretics, cursed those who had deceased and ordered their bones dug up and dishonored. The Cry History of the Reformation in Spain, page 35. During the reign of Pope Gregory X, England's James I reaffirmed the decision of Tarangona in 1234, which had ordered all vernacular versions to be brought to the bishop to be burned. Pope Nicholas IV, from 1288 to 1292, ordered many punishments to be inflicted upon heretics and their accomplices with a confirmation of the rescripts of the anterior popes. 
Pope Honorius IV enacted two laws against heretics similar to the preceding ones. The popes affirmed and enforced the restrictions against vernacular Bible translations, and in the 13th century, inquisitorial tribunals were permanently erected in the principal towns of the Kingdom of Aragon and elsewhere in Spain, where the Dominicans had established convents. Pope John XXIII attempted to convert the Waldenses to Roman dogma and papal authority, and failing at this, he poured out persecutions upon these people. Desirous of resuming the work of Innocent III, he ordered the inquisitors to repair to the valleys of Lucerna and Perosa and execute the laws of the Vatican against the heretics that people that against the heretics that people them. What success attended the expedition is not known, and we instance it and we instance it chiefly on this account that the bull commanding it bears undesigned testimony to the then flourishing condition of the Waldensian Church, inasmuch as it complains that synods, which the Pope calls chapters, were wont to assemble in the Valley of Angrona, attended by 500 delegates. This was before Wycliffe had begun his career in England. This is out of this is what out of Wiley history of the Waldenses, out of Macrae history of the Reformation in Spain, Pope Clement the Sixth urged persecutions against the Waldensian Christians. In 1352, he charged the Bishop of Embrun to purify that area of those who refused to bow to Rome's authority. A Franciscan friar was appointed inquisitor to oversee this work. Wiley, History of the Waldenses. In Spain, too, the brutal inquisition went about its evil business. The persecutions of the Albigenses seldom, Albigenses seldom relaxed during the 14th century. Scarce a year passed in which numbers were not barbarously led to the stake. Pope Innocent VI was visited by the Irishman Filsraff, who complained of the attack on the scriptures by Roman Catholic monks in Ireland. Filsraff preached zealously against monkery in Ireland and England and had gone to face Innocent VI himself on the subject of those exactions and abuses which had become past all endurances. According to a manuscript possessed by the historian John Fox, Fitzralph testified that the Lord had taught him and brought him out of the profound vanities of Aristotle's philosophy to the scriptures of God. He stood before the Pope of Rome and complained that no book could stir, whether in divinity, law, or physics, but these friars were able and ready to buy it up. Fitzralph had sent four of his chaplains on a journey from Armagh to Oxford, seeking scriptures and sound religious materials. The result of their search was that they, quote, sent him word again that they could neither find the Bible nor any other good profitable book in divinity, meet for their study, and therefore were minded to return home to their own country. Anderson tells us that it has been often repeated that Fitz, Fitzralph translated the New Testament into the Irish language, or at least that a translation existed in his time, but this assertion cannot be confirmed, and Fitzralph died in the year 1360. So here is some Bibles in many languages during the Middle Ages. In spite of the attempt by the Roman Catholic Church to keep the vernacular Bibles out of the hands of the, of the people, many translations appeared in the Middle Ages. The Bible in whole, or in part, had been translated into some 25 languages before the invention of printing from movable type, about 1450. There were Spanish translations as early as the 12th century. The Bible first appeared in Old Norse, the language of Norway and her colonies in Iceland, Greenland, and Finland in 1220 A.D., a second edition was made in 1310. The Wycliffe English Bible appeared in 1380. A translation of the whole Bible in French first appeared in the 13th century, and a much-used version of the whole Bible was published in 1487 by Jean de Rely. Translations in German appeared in the 13th and 14th century. And portions of the scripture in the Dutch language appeared even before 1200 AD. Little is known about these versions. In 1270, Jacob van Mer Merlant completed the four Gospels in Dutch, translated from the Vulgate. In 1477, Jacob Jacobson 
and Marita Siemens published a Dutch Old Testament. Another Dutch translation appeared at Gouda in 1479. Translations of portions of the Bible in Swedish and Danish were made in the mid-14th century. Portions of the Bible were translated into Arabic by Raymond Lull for the Muslims in the 14th century. The complete Bible in Swedish appeared in the 15th century. The Old Bohemian Bible, which dated to the 9th century, was revised by, G by Jan Hus in the early 15th century. The first complete Slavonic Bible dates to 1499. With the invention of printing by movable type, the publication of Bibles exploded. By 1520, no less than 199 printed editions of the entire Bible had appeared. Of these, 156 were Latin, 17 German, 11 Italian, 2 Bohemian, and 1 Russian. The Bible in whole or in part had been printed in 22 languages and dialects before Luther published his New Testament in 1522. We will say more about the translations of the 15th and 16th century later in these studies. So thus is going to conclude this portion of um, Rome and the Bible, talking about the Waldenses and the persecutions during the Dark Ages. And so now we're going to continue in the next video discussing John Wycliffe, and the Lollards and the persecutions from the 1350 to 1500 AD. So basically, John Wycliffe is the culmination and is the morning star that ignites the Reformation, that takes the church out of the Dark Ages. Because it's from him that the seeds of light started to grow emphatically. We had little bits and portions of light through the Waldenses and these types of things. And they were ruthlessly persecuted as, as we discovered. But I also wanted to cover the Waldenses in this light because they were never, you know, they were never ones to come out of because they, they were never a part of. They always had the light of scripture. They always had scripture as their authority and Jesus Christ was their head. No pope no priest, no nothing. They were able to commit to memory the whole New Testament. They can recite it from memory, all of it word for word. And so how can you not sit there and think to yourselves that these have to have been the offspring of those Christians that fled to Pella after 70 A.D.? When they give testimony that they represent the, the, the apostolic era of the Christian faith, I believe them. I believe what they say. And they were ruthlessly attacked and ruthlessly tortured. All for the simple aspect that it is intolerable for the simple to be able to preach from the Word of God without the authority of the church. And this is a doctrine that goes way back to the Alexandrian Church Fathers such as Justin Martyr, Oregon, and even the great Augustine himself. And this is why men like the Waldenses and those before them stood up against these Alexandrian fathers and these Waldenses stood up against the Church of Rome and they paid dearly for it but they persevered and now we come to John Wycliffe and this will conclude our study of the Dark Ages I mean, even after I get done with John, Wy John Wycliffe, this is just scratching the surface. Even with, with what I covered here, it's just scratching the surface. I mean, I could spend probably my whole life on the Dark Ages and never come to the conclusion of it. But I wanted to emphasize 
these two groups, the Lollards under John Wycliffe and the Waldenses, because those are two paramount figures within the Dark Ages that I think need to be expressed. So I want to thank you for listening. <laughs> Hour and 45 minutes. I know this one was really long, but uh, I think it's well worth the time. So truth be told, truth be known, stay safe, God bless, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.